What's up, my friend? Welcome back to another video. And today I'm really excited to share with you an exclusive sneak peek behind my new composing course, Composing with Color. Um, this is gonna be a jam-packed video. I love harmony. I love talking about diatonic and non-diatonic harmony, how it kind of integrates with each other. And so this video specifically will go over six unique non-diatonic harmony devices that you can use to really spice up your chord progressions and just make your overall piece of music so much more interesting. So again, this is taken directly from the course. You're gonna get 100% free access to this, no strings attached. And if you wanna check out the full course in its entirety, then feel free to check out the first link down below. And at the time of this recording, uh, you can grab it at intro price before the doors close as well. Um, if it's in the future and the doors are closed, um, wait until the next time it's open. I'm sure it will be very soon. But uh, just so you know, you can grab it right now for the best deal if you join us this week. So anyway, without further ado, let's jump on into the harmony techniques and I hope you enjoy. What's up, my friend? Welcome back to the next video. So here we're diving into the meat and potatoes of what this course is all about, non-diatonic harmony. Okay, so we're gonna talk about some devices that you can use to sweeten up your chord progressions, just move beyond the diatonic stuff and just really give you some new ideas to inject into your chord progressions to make them sound magical and amazing, okay? So first of all, let's just cover what is non-diatonic harmony? Well, diatonic means it's just based off of the regular major and the minor scale. Everything we just talked about in the previous videos is essentially diatonic stuff. So non-diatonic is therefore anything based outside of the major and the minor scale. And again, you wanna keep in mind, this is all about context. So if we're in the C major scale, there are basically seven different chords we have available to us, one all the way through seven. So if we bring in any chords that include sharps in them or flats in them, that's gonna be non-diatonic because again, we're introducing sharps and flats or accidentals into the key of C major, which naturally has zero sharps and flats. So that's just a quick example. Ideally, in terms of balance, we use non-diatonic techniques and chords to spice up the existing color palette and introduce some twists and turns along the way. So throwing in a hint of the unexpected is a really good way to keep things fresh and moving. So I like to think of it as kind of like an 80% diatonic, 20% non-diatonic in a way. That's the sort of balance I usually go for. And just remember, any, anything we discuss here are you are basically things you want to use to sprinkle in here and there. So don't overdo it. And that's why I refer to the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of uh, the results that we get is usually created by 20% of the actions that we take. That's kind of a, a little life, I guess, motto that you can apply to really any field. But in music, it also works as well. So regular stuff, comforting stuff, traditional stuff, I like to do maybe 70-80% of the time. And then Occasionally, I'll throw in the non-diatonic stuff around 20 to 30% of the time, just to keep things interesting. So the first device I want to cover here is secondary dominance. A secondary dominant is essentially an altered chord, right, or a non-diatonic chord that serves a dominant function to a chord in the original key other than the tonic. So this altered chord introduces a note that's non-diatonic, which does not belong in the original key. And that's why it's one of the first ones I want to come with because, or lead out with, is because it introduces one to two notes outside of your scale, but there are other notes that are also belonging to the original scale. It's really pretty. Um, so just to quickly show you an example here, uh, we're in the key of C major, right? So if we just ignore the yellow chord for a second, like the second chord, ignore that for a second, I have a one, five, one, right? One, five, one. But what we can do is add an additional chord, which is the secondary dominant chord we're talking about here. If we take the five chord, which is the third chord, and we find its dominant chord, so pretend for a moment that the G chord, the G major chord is the tonic, or you know, the, we're in the key of G major. Well, what's the five chord in G? One, two, three, four, five. It's actually D, the D major chord, right? Because in G major, the five chord is major, in which it makes it a D major chord. So if we proceed the G chord with its dominant chord, it's introducing the F sharp, which is the non-diatonic note in the key of C major. And so it introduces that color and it makes us feel, ooh, something new just happened. But when it resolves to the G major chord, then it brings us back to the key of C major because we understand now that the five chord in, uh, in C major is the same as the one chord in G major. So they kind of share that same chord, they have that chord in common, 
And because we're back to the key of C major, we can then resolve back to the key of C major or the chord of C major. So if I play these four chords all together, it sounds like this. One, five of five, which is kind of what we would call it. Five, one. So one, five of five, five, one. So it sounds super natural. It's great. Um, and the, again, the only difference is that secondary dominant introducing that F sharp in there. Right, so in C major, again, let's just read this out. The dominant of the five chord or G major is D major, which then introduces that F sharp into the key of C major. But as long as we resolve that uh, D major chord to its tonic, which is G major, we're going to get that resolution and it brings us back to the key of C major. So the alter chord, in this case, again, that D chord is typically followed by its natural resolution, which serves as a temporary tonic in the original key. So the G chord is kind of our temporary tonic after which it still it basically reverts back to the dominant function, right? Let me show one more example. Let's say we want to find the uh, the dominant chord of the four chord. So instead of the five chord, let's start with the four chord. So we have the one chord. Let's say we want to go to the four chord, but let's proceed to four chord with its dominant. So in C major, the four chord is F major, right? So if F is our temporary tonic now, then what is its dominant? Well, we find the fifth note in F major, one, two, three, four, five, and that's a C. So F, G, A, B flat, C. And then if we play the dominant chord, that's just gonna be a C major chord, but if we added that seventh in there, that's the B flat. That's the key note in F major. So if we do C major, and then we go to C7 with a B flat in there, and then go to the F major chord, and then go to the G major chord, back to C major chord. That's a really nice way to use a secondary dominant as well. So it's like one, five of four, to the four, to the five, to the one. Right? One more example. Let's let's find the dominant of the six chord. Okay, so in the key of C major, the six chord is A minor. So what's the five chord in A minor? One, two, three, four, five. That's E major. And we can add in the seventh there as well. So we could do one, five of six, or five, seven of six, dominant seventh, with a G sharp in there. And then we have the six chord, back to the five, back to the one, right? So the idea is whatever chord that's not the one chord, you can try finding its dominant chord, see if it has a, a, a note in it that's different, uh, that's not diatonic to your original key, and then just proceed your uh, temporary tonic with that chord. So then it resolves to that temporary tonic and then the piece continues on, but you have that additional color that just adds a bit of spice. And this is something I do all the time. Uh, so, so fun, it sounds great. And I'm just, yeah, I, I, I love this one, okay? So that's secondary dominant. The next one is modal mixture. This is another one of my favorites. This is the act of using the chords from a key's parallel key for added color. And parallel just simply means sharing the same tonic or root note but the opposite quality. So the C major scale and the C minor scale are parallel keys. So uh, you can see here in um, the, the red notes on the bottom where we have kind of the, uh, the C minor scale, right? The C minor chords. So we have the one chord, which is minor, the two chord, which is diminished, and all of the red notes are, or the pink notes are, um, are the flats that are influenced by the key signature here because the C minor scale has three flats, right? So we're just making a note of all the notes <clears throat> um, in each of the chords that require those flats. So the idea is, for example, if I'm in a major scale, I could borrow any of the respective chords from the minor scale and bring them into my major chord progression. So for example, I could go, if I just wanna go one, four, five, one, that's very traditional in C major, but what if I replaced the four chord the major four chord with the minor four chord from C minor. So I could go one, minor four, five, one. That has a very interesting sound to it, right? Or what if uh, maybe I want to do one, six, five, one in the key of C major. What if I replace the six chord, which is minor, with the, the major six in the minor scale, right? In C minor. So that would be, make it an A flat major chord. So one, six, five, one. 
and we would call it a flat six because in the context of C major, the A is natural, but if we flat it, it becomes an A flat chord, right? A flat major chord. So one, so C major, A flat major, G major, and C major. You know? So it, again, you're, we're kind of sprinkling in and borrowing these chords. Uh, you don't want to borrow every single chord or else you might as well just change your key, but um, that's the general idea. And so, uh, yeah, this is, uh, I just did a quick visual example to show you here. So instead of just going one, four, five, one, if we replace the major four with a minor four, then we get one minor four, five to one, right? So it creates sort of a temporary sad sound that's really useful. But one of my favorite progressions is if I'm in a major key, I will use both the flat six and the flat seven chords. Um, or the you know the six and the seven chords in the minor scale. So in this case, that would be A flat major, B flat major, and then go back to my major scale or my my tonic in the major key. So A flat major, B flat major, C major, and both those A flat and B flat chords are borrowed from C minor, the six and the seven chords. So that's modal mixture. Um, so at any point you want to kind of throw in a bit of spice, you can choose one of your chords, which you might want to replace from the parallel key, and then just take that chord and put it in there. And you can get some really nice colors. And again, it's non-diatonic because those notes do not belong to the key of your major scale or whatever scale you're in. Device number three is really interesting. This is tritone substitution. So this is when we substitute a dominant seventh chord with another dominant seventh that is a tritone or three whole steps away. So here's a quick example. Um, if we play the traditional chord progression here on the left, it sounds like this. Two, five, one, right? And we have C major seven, which makes a sort of a jazzy sound. But what if we replace that G seven, that dominant seventh with another dominant seventh chord, a tritone away. And a tritone again is three semi or three whole tones. So from G, I can go either up or down three whole tones. So one, two, three, and I get to D flat. And if I go up, it's the same thing from G, A, B, D flat, right? So if we build a dominant seventh on that new note, we get this really beautiful sound that's so outside of our original key that it, it really holds that attention until it resolves back to the original uh, tonic chord. So the original again sounds like this, two, five, one. Then the tritone substitution sounds like this, two, flat two, seven, basically, to the one. So it's a really great uh, dominant chord substitution, if that makes sense. We can look at another example here, and basically we can chain these kind of sort of tritone substitutions together. So we can have a D7 chord, go down a tritone substitution or tritone to A flat seven before we have another dominant seven. And we have another D flat seven, which is again, a tritone away from the G seven, go to C seven, go down a tritone to G flat seven, down to F seven, down another tritone to B seven. And then this can just continue onwards. But without the tritone subs or without those circled chords, it would just get a D7, G7, C7, F7, which is basically just working your way down the circle of fifths, right? But you can add in a, uh, a, a tritone substitution after each of the first chords so you can get this sort of um, colorful sequence instead of just being traditional with a circle of fifths. So really, really cool. Uh, I really enjoy that. All right. Number four is augmented sixth chords. And this is um, a really interesting one because it contains an augmented sixth interval above the bass note using the flat six and the sharp four or A flat and F sharp in the key of C major. So that probably sounds a little confusing, but if we think about it, 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 it kind of makes sense if you look at it visually. Um, so in the key of C major, right? The A flat is flat six and then the F sharp Above that is a sixth interval, but it's an augmented sixth. So it's it's quite large for a sixth. And it's built on the flat six of the scale, right? So that's that's kind of why it's it's called that. Um, so it traditionally resolves to the diatonic dominant chord of the key. The bottom and the top notes will resolve outwards. And I'll show you a quick example here. But there are three basic types of augmented sixth chords. There's the Italian sixth, which only contains three distinct notes. So we have the flat six which is the basis of that chord. Then we have the, the third, right? So A flat, C, 
and then we have the F sharp. And that is our augmented sixth interval. That's why it's called an augmented sixth chord. And we basically double the third, and this is our Italian sixth. Okay. The French sixth is the same as the Italian, but there's an added second degree of the scale, which has that whole tone sound. So it sounds like this. So the D natural in there in the alto voice, that is what's creating that crunchy sound. And then the German six is probably the most common one because this one literally is like a dominant seventh. It sounds the same as a dominant seventh. It's just spelled a little bit differently. So there's the flat or there's the fifth of the chord. So E flat, C, E flat, and F sharp instead of a G flat, because if it was a G flat, it would just be a regular dominant seventh chord. But in this case, it's called an F sharp. But all three of these chords want to resolve outwards to the dominant uh, the regular dominant chord of whatever scale you're in. So if I'm in the key state of C major, I can go one flat six, right? Do the do the uh, the augmented six chord, and then resolve to the five chord, and then go back to the one chord. Really, really interesting. Uh, so yeah, it is, I guess this is more important if you're doing more like notation. If you want to write out those different notes, you want to just make sure the spelling is correct. But when it comes to the actual listening of the music as long as you have that flat six in there so you have that major chord and then you add in that flat seven or a sharp six of that chord you're going to get that sort of dominant sound even without the fifth in there right and if you have it the french six, then then you have that um that added second of the scale that also was on, result wants to resolve up to the dominant chord right so all three of these chords are really good predominant chords which can then go back to the tonic all right, so that's another device you can use. And then fifth is a Neapolitan second. This one is awesome. So it's a major triad built on the flat two of the major minor scale. So instead of building it on the flat six, creating sort of a dominant sound, now we have a major triad built on the flat two. So for example, that would be D flat major in the key of C major or C minor. So right in the key of C major or C minor, we just, instead of going to the second note of the scale, we go down a semitone and create a nice major sound there. And so it's typically used in this first inversion, uh, which is a Neapolitan sixth, that's that's the name for it, and functions as a predominant chord, very similar to the Neapolitan, uh, similar to the augmented sixth chords, as the bass note is the same as in the four chord. So let's show a quick example here. Um, you can see here in the red box, we have the flat two chord, which is a D flat major chord, but the bass note is F, which is the third of that chord. So it's a first inversion, right? And what's really cool is that F on the bottom is the same as the subdominant note in the scale, which is F. Because usually that would be like an F major chord or F minor chord in the key of C major or C minor, right? So if I were to play this progression, it's in the key of C minor, so it would sound like this. One, six, Right? That's the Neapolitan six or the flat two in first inversion. Then we go to five and back to the one. Very, very cool. And it works again so well because first of all, that D flat provides so much color to the key because you know the, the flat two just doesn't exist normally in a in the major or minor scale. But again, that bottom note is the same as the fourth note of the scale, the subdominant, and that naturally wants to lead up to the dominant. So subdominant, dominant and tonic. So four, five, one, but the notes above that four are not the four chord, it's actually the flat two chord, but simply in first inversion. So does that make sense? That That's a really cool, cool one too. Let's let's play this chord, uh, progression in major actually. So in C major, we have the one chord major, six chord minor, there's the flat two or Neapolitan six, five, one. So in both major or minor, you're going to get that nice crunch of that flat two in there. And it just introduces a very dark and regal color to that progression, I hope you would agree. So I would definitely recommend just practicing this in uh, you know, all the different scales that you know. Um, and uh, yeah, you'll, you'll get some good options there. And the number six is chromatic medians, of course, right? This is a super common device that you've probably heard about, but in its most simple terms, chromatic alteration to the root or the third of an available diatonic median or submedian chord is what a chromatic median is. And that already sounds so complicated, but let's let's take a, a quick look at this, right? So if we're in the key of, or if, we're, if we have a C major chord, let's find a chord that is a third away. 
either going up or down. So I can go up or down a major or minor third. Now, some of these chords will naturally be diatonic to that key of C major, but some of them won't be. So if I go from C major up a major third, what would that give me? Well, C, D, E, that's basically the third note of the major scale. And if I play an E minor chord, well, that's already in the key of C major, right? So one chord to three chord, but what if we make the E chord major? So we have that G sharp in there. So we have C major to E major. Now that suddenly sounds really cool. We're going from one to like three, but major three. You know what I mean? So that's really cool. What if we do C major up a minor third to E flat major? So that still sounds really good because there's still a common tone there. Um, the C major chord and the E flat major chord both share the G natural, right? Whereas the C major chord to the E major chord both share an E natural. E is the common tone between both chords. So as long as you have a common tone between the two chords you're going to, even if there's a non-diatonic note, the transition is going to be relatively smooth. We can go the other direction here. So let's go from C major down a major or minor third. So if we go down um, a minor third to A major, we're introducing a C sharp in there, but again, it still sounds pretty smooth because they have the E in common. If I go from C down to A flat major, that still sounds really cool too because they both have the C in common, right? So if you're not going to a diatonic chord, then going to one of these other chords is a really cool idea um, because most likely you're going to have a common note between both of those chords and then you're going to have a non-diatonic note introducing a new color in there. So you're either going to rely on the parallel tonality, which means uh, you're going to major or minor opposite, and you're also going to change its chord quality. So for example, C major to um, A flat minor, or C minor to A flat major, right? Like you can change the quality, but you can also change the, uh, the, the tonality as well. Um, so yeah, in C major, the diatonic median chord is E minor because that's just part of the scale and the submedian is A minor. So chromatic medians would be then E major and A major, C to A major. And then you could also go from C to E flat major or C to A flat major because here we're altering the roots. We're actually changing the root of the chords themselves. Um, and there's also one common tone that's shared. So if there are no common tones and the chord qualities are opposite, then it would be considered a double chromatic median. And so one example of this would be from C major to E flat minor. Because we are still going up a minor third here, but they have no common tones. And so we would call that a double chromatic median. Okay. Let me play this little progression here at the bottom right here. So one, four, flat two. Uh, this is the minor six, minor flat six and then going to the one chord. And so the chromatic median is mainly in the second to third chords, because we have the F major chord going down to the D flat chord, right? So that has a common tone of F, but we have the additional color notes of D flat and A flat, so very colorful. And then we have the A flat minor going to the C chord. Little chromatic median there also. Um, they actually don't have any notes in common but they're still a third apart because A flat to C is a major third. But it's just a really interesting way. So this is where you can start to play around with tons and tons of colors. This is probably the most complex device out of the six, but you can see how many options you have available to you aside from the just normal diatonic chords. Whatever chord you're, you're settled in, experiment going up or down a major or minor third and then see what common tones you have um, see what the ultra notes are, the, the non-diatonic notes, and see if they kind of fit within your context of their piece. Okay, so let's just quickly recap here. The first device was the secondary dominant, which means you're finding the dominant of a chord other than the tonic. The modal mixture means you're borrowing chords from a key's parallel key, so if you're in the key of C major, you borrow chords from C minor. Tritone substitution is when you replace a dominant seventh chord with the dominant seventh chord a tritone away which creates a really nice semitone sort of resolution, by the way. Uh, we have the augmented sixth chord, which is a predominant chord using the flat six and the sharp four 
creating that augmented sixth interval. Um, and it, it leads really nicely to the dominant chord. Then we have the Neapolitan second, and this is a major chord built on the flat two of a major or minor key, which we just covered. And then we have the chromatic median, which is built from altering the root or the third of a median or submedian chord, or the third or the sixth chord. All right. Um, this might be a, a whole ton and feel like a little bit overwhelming if you're new to this, but it's definitely really useful, super, super colorful stuff that you can play around with here and uh, gives you lots of options. The last thing I just wanna leave you with here though is don't go crazy with this. We talked about balance, right? It's all about balance, making sure that you establish a certain expectation and then you kind of mix it up sparingly to create interest and color, but you don't wanna go overboard with this. So listeners will really only appreciate these devices when used in combination with functional diatonic harmony. And again, think of it like 80-20, 80% diatonic or sticking to the regular major and minor devices, and then 20% non-diatonic or going with spicy chords. So again, that's how I typically approach my own music, and I like to create something satisfying and then an enjoyable that tells a comforting story, but every now and then I'll add in a hint of spice and color to change things up. And again, just to let you know, my favorite devices are probably the secondary dominant and the modal mixture. It's, it's close enough to the original key that bringing in those chords doesn't sound overly abrupt, but it also adds in enough color that it feels interesting and spicy at the same time. So those are just my devices of choice, but I wanted to share with you six that you can use very easily in your own music. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that. Let's jump into the next video and we'll keep on going. All right, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it. And again, if you wanna check out the full course in its entirety and read all about it, feel free to click the first link down below. And this is basically my full composing system for taking your existing tracks and really just juicing them up and giving them way more color and interest and flow to really move and impact your listener on a deeper level. And if you wanna take something with you that will help you with your music right away, I would love to give you my five steps to writing thematic music in the style of Disney and Nintendo. So this is a totally free guide going over some of my favorite devices that goes over how to actually write music that sounds uplifting and motivating and exciting. And we go super in depth. I use practical examples and you can take these and apply them to your music right away. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you in the next video and I'll see you inside Composing with Color. Take care.